This is one of the problems with leaving TuneCore, which I am doing and I'm working on that. Right now with that bill that is just being drafted for the pay musicians fairly bill or whatever it is, you know, I think like with that information, it's just kind of like, wait, you're going to tax listeners to pay me when we have this mess happening like this, like there has to be some sort of antitrust issue or something with all these companies owning a portion of each other. And then musicians, especially independent musicians, always being on the wrong end of that equation. Like, like, you know, if you're going to tackle that, I suppose that that might be a much better way to get musicians. I mean, how hard would it be to convince Congress to pay musicians the same rate all around, whether they're on a major label or whether they're an independent, you know, just out of the same pool? Like, well, to like, even help them understand, I think, would be the biggest first hurdle. Right. Ever. Yeah, like like this isn't happening. It's unfair. Metallica gets paid more per stream than, you know, y- your son does. Like that it's a pretty easy thing. Like most people are on board with that argument. It's a lot easier than saying, you know, like we're going to tax people this much on top of what they're paying or, you know, the government's going in like I feel like that's just a hard sell. Well, I guess okay, so so taking what you're saying is true, right? So if if, you know, these big companies like Spotify are to insolvent, right? Can they even do this? I mean, we get the argument, right? Artists should be paid more mm-hmm. and they should be able to make a living from this, but can these platforms even do it? Yeah, well, the the problem is that if Spotify just started paying everybody equal, you know, like equal royalties, equal fraction of a cent per stream, then major labels would start pulling out and they would lose. If you look at like the actual like Spotify's recommended playlists, for example, I think DistroKid claims to be putting over a third of the music on Spotify that's on Spotify. Like they claim to be, uh, this is their own words. I don't know how true or untrue it is. Yet a lot of times they're under 1% of like the new music Friday playlists that Spotify like all the biggest playlists. And so you could kind of tell that there's some payola going on already or some favoritism, or it could just be like the, I want to say it's a crazy marketing from major labels, but like you don't really see it anymore the way that you used to. It's like the industry's changed so much. There's just so much to unpack there. And the major labels would certainly throw a fit if their royalties got cut in half per stream and, you know, mine got <laughs> increased or and I, I do know that TuneCore, they even have their own this is one of the problems with leaving TuneCore, which I do, which I am doing and I'm working on that. But they've negotiated their own rate. Like you may actually get paid more through TuneCore than you would through DistroKid yeah. or through whatever yeah. company. Which and actually is... that's that's the pretty common across the board with the bigger distributors. Mm-hmm. I represent a medium, you know, sized distributor and they've negotiated theirs as well. And they usually do that across the platform with, you know, each platform. We were talking recently about how, you know, speaking of labels throwing tantrums, you know, universal through a tantrum yeah. about the amount from TikTok being paid or not yeah. paid to really itself. It's like, we're advocates for the artists. I'm like, what are you talking about? They don't own any of the music. You're advocates for yourself. Anyway. And right. and so, you know, they're like our license, right? To have the music on the platform has expired. We're not going to renew unless you give us more money. TikTok's like F you. So here we are. And I, for me, I was just kind of like, you know, the ball's on universal because, because TikTok is, it's more of the like ancillary benefits of the music beyond the platform. It's not so much of the money that you're making. It's the exposure that your artists are getting, that these songs are getting. Right. Because yeah. then from the virality, we get movie placements and TV and film. You know what I'm saying? And so anyway, that was my perspective on it. They're still at a stand still, but but they do throw tantrums indeed. Yeah, I could absolutely see that happening with with Spotify and all the streaming club. But they also have I mean, I'm assuming that if they own 10 percent, that they probably have board seats like voting. They're probably voting members as well of those types of decisions. But with Spotify not being able to make a profit, I mean, they still have cash flow. I mean, they just paid Joe Rogan, what, $250 million or something for a non-exclusive to just keep him there. Oh, it's non-exclusive? Yeah, it's like, it's like made up up monopoly dollars. Yeah, but the problem, I, I mean, I would say that Spotify's biggest issue right now, like if I, I'm guessing, would be that they took out a bunch of they, they got a bunch of VC loans in 2020 and 2021 when interest rates were super low, when 
growth was super high because everybody was at home listening to music and they needed to be a premium subscriber. And now they're having trouble showing the same signs of growth. They're sort of reaching a ceiling. VCs are less interested in that business model. And now interest rates are, are through the roof. So now these the VC offers that they're having to renegotiate have like crazy coupons and payback coupons and terms and all these things. I feel, you know, there is a chance that it's going to trigger a feedback loop with the, how the money goes in and out because Spotify's entire business model is let's get a bunch of VC money. Let's subsidize a lifestyle improvement for our customers to where they get unlimited music for $10 a month. And then we'll work it out with the major labels and we'll just give them all of the VC money and we'll do that first. And then fast forward, eventually we'll take over the entire music industry and then we can raise prices to whatever we want. We could treat the labels however we want because we'll be the, we'll, we'll be the only way that people can listen to music. Like that's, that, that's the, that's a blitz scaling. That's the, the business strategy that they've used. And it is effective in some areas like Amazon did it very well. You know, like Amazon just took investor money and grew and grew and grew, and they've always reinvested in growth. And now, like Walmart, you know, it wasn't long before Walmart was trying to like play catch up to what Amazon was doing, which at the time was like unfathomable, right? But the problem with Spotify is that like this this hasn't even shown to be that profitable profitable at all with like Uber, where like you have very a tangible service. Whereas like something like IP, it's, it's infinite. There's no scarcity. And Spotify doesn't own most of the content that it's distributing. It's just leasing it month to month at a rate that they're making up and nobody's happy with it. And so it's kind of, it just seems more and more like a house of cards to me. It's funny you mentioned Walmart. I think it was reading yesterday. You see how these big companies will institute something to make a profit, right? So they, they they kill the staff, they put in the self-checkout kiosks, right? So they have less, less yeah. checkout people. And I guess the update is that there's so many people stealing from them yes. who will like scan something and have a different <laughs> barcode that they're rehiring. And then they're also doing some kind of like paid subscription thing. So you pay like a hundred bucks and that you can self-check out if you are part of this membership. So it's interesting <laughs> to see how they're pivoting. But I think, you, you know, earlier you were kind of talking about this self-correction that happens and I totally feel like that's going to be the case with because there's so much AI and at some point people may not just believe anything that they're seeing or reading because it's just you know that yeah perhaps perhaps and then there'll be a self-correction that people even in the music industry right there's talk about people going back to vinyl which you know people are buying vinyl again we even go back yeah. to CDs but you know the tangible it doesn't make sense you have you know free access <laughs> anytime but that we would kind of overcorrect and 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 go back at some point because stuff just becomes out of control and i see that happening my hope makes most most lawyers in this industry reel back in horror um but but i i swear it's good my hope is that we slowly abandoned we we abandoned ip and copyright because I, I think that... Abandon. Oh, oh, you're right. Oh, my goodness. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I felt the air leave your body from... Yeah. <laughs> Truly, the history of copyright is quite problematic. It's quite classist. It doesn't... It, it's always been a bunch of bandages wrapped on a new cut. You know, like... And that's how we got to, like, how we treat intellectual property today. It's very silly in a lot of ways. How many years was it illegal to sing happy birthday to your kid in a public Too place? Far. Like just as far as got sued, in fact. Yeah, right. And like when we can't even figure out who wrote happy birthday, like we can't even figure out who the actual crew, like, I, you know, it's between two old women at the time who are like arguing over, but like nobody's getting money from this who actually wrote it. It doesn't make any sense yet. That's the way we're doing it. I'm scarce. You're scarce. Your time is scarce. All, all of our time is scarce. A music file is not. It can be copied as many times as possible. It's very, very hard. When you think about it from a philosophical standpoint, we make fun of people for like trading crypto, for trading Bitcoin. When Bitcoin actually, and I'm not a Bitcoin advocate by a long shot, but when Bitcoin actually makes a lot more sense because there's actually like a proof of work mechanism to give it value and scarcity like that's whereas 
copyright, intellectual property doesn't have that at all. The only way you can have scarcity is by threatening people to put them in prison if they if they copy it. Like that's the okay, only okay. way. Let me, that you- let, me, let me clarify to make sure I'm understanding that because the idea of copyright is to create that scarcity because people cannot mm-hmm. copy, distribute, right. create yeah. derivative work, but they can. things. But you're saying they can't. <laughs> so in practical effect, that thing yeah. is not happening. Okay. Yeah. So I think it's it's one of those things where like if there's something happening and you have to threaten to lock people in a cage to prevent it from happening and it's not actually like you know, causing direct harm to somebody else or something like that, then maybe that's a little bit problematic. It Sometimes I look at, I mean, cause like I've made money from IP my entire life. That's like how I've survived as an adult. So it's very much like the, I, I have this argument. I feel like I have these thoughts in my head and I'm very much aware that it is biting a hand that's, that's fed me. But ultimately I'm doing better now through Patreon. One, uh, uh, I guess a funny funny thing in the past, I had a big spat with iTunes in 20, 2007, 2006, maybe 2007. And they had my music up there and I wasn't getting paid from it. Like the label that I was with went under and Orchard, they, whatever Orchard was called before they were Orchard was essentially distributing my music and keeping all the royalties. And I couldn't get in touch with anybody, couldn't get in touch with Apple. I finally contacted an attorney the attorney filed suit and magically my music came off of iTunes. And so I was just so annoyed by it that I just upload, I had a new album coming out that I'd worked on for a really long time. And I just, you know, they're still selling CDs and stuff like that at the time. And I just uploaded it all to torrent sites because I was like, you know what? It's going to be up there anyway. It's that they get tens of thousands of downloads from these like music torrent sites. So why don't I do it, do it right. Like give them the actual masters that sound right, where it's not going to have an error in the, the CD rip or something like that. And then give them an HTML file where it just has a PayPal link if they want to support me. And I made more from that than I had ever made from any other album ever, because it was like, this is an artist we like listening to. Let's support him rather than trading in intellectual property, which has always been problematic. It's all like, especially like when we think about when music started getting monetized digitally, like it started before iTunes, but like iTunes was like the big time, the first time it was mainstream. And right off the bat, it was like, we're taking a third. That's it. We're taking a third and there's no way to circumvent that. And it's like, holy shit, a third, a third of everything I make, Apple's going to get because they're, because, because they're allowing a file to be downloaded. I know how much it costs to send a file to somebody. I know much the server, it's not a third, you know? And so, and it just kept going from there. And then you got to pay TuneCore to have it up there. And at that time it was like $79 an album per year. It was a, the, the fee was absolutely insane. And yeah. And I think just over the years, I've just been, I'm so glad that we've reached a point now to where it's actually acceptable to just say, I like this person's work. I'm going to subscribe or give them, you know, I'm just going to support it. Whether, and most of my patrons, I would say probably 99% of them don't even care if I update the Patreon. They just want to support what's going on on the channel or in the music or something like that. And I was skeptical that that would ever work three years ago. I didn't want to do a Patreon. I never wanted to do that because it felt like charity or something. I didn't want yeah. to do that. But now it's funding scientific research. I, my my channel, my YouTube channel operates under a nonprofit. Like it's actually working and it's awesome. And it's so much better than deal than what's happening on the other side with TuneCore and Spotify. A music attorney is your number one legal resource for artists, producers, and record labels. Get contract templates, one-on-one legal advice, free master classes, and everything you need for your music business. Go to tommusicattorney.com. Okay, so then let me ask you this. So obviously your music still is on DSPs. It's on Spotify. I have it up right now. So you haven't decided to, you know, say all together, no, if you want to support my music, so like some other artists yeah. have, you can buy my CDs or download it from my website. And my only argument to that is it still is marketing. Like if I want to just check you out real quick and then kind of take through a sales funnel, right? Mm-hmm. Artists right. are not very good salespeople. And that's what you're talking about. You go, I mean, really, that's what it was. A sales play yeah. of like, you support me. Here's the thing. I'm just giving it to you. If you want to support me, great. Let's do it. If not, I still love you and we're connected, all that. Yeah. 
And I think that obviously you cut off exposure potentially by not being on the platforms, but you do give up something by being there. What's your what's your take on that? From my perspective, my ba- the reason my music is on Spotify to begin with, once the the streaming thing started happening and once my pay started going down, because it was good in the beginning, it was actually, I was getting paid quite, quite well from Spotify. And I don't know the exact stat, but for me, the, cl- the pay I was getting per stream dropped by something like 60% over five years. And it got to the point where I was just like, you know, <laughs> incensed by it. The reason why my music is still... On any of those platforms, the reason I haven't moved away from that is because of the accessibility of my list for the people who listen to it. Most of my listeners either don't know how to listen to an MP3 file on their iPhone, which should be extremely easy to do, but it's not. And we've kind of lost lost touch with that because, I mean, Apple doesn't let you have access to your own file system, right? So it's kind of, it's problematic in other ways, but... They've made it extremely hard to leave the ecosystem where you are paying for, you know, paying these companies. The problem is that if I pull all my music off Spotify, which is what people thought I did because I've been so critical of it, they thought I just had it and pulled it off. And that's why I was getting so many messages when TuneCore pulled it. The problem with that is that you're taking it away from people. You're punishing them when they're just listening to music the way that they listen to music. Mm -hmm. I can't ask everybody to like, install Winamp or like buy the, buy this CD or whatever it is. You can't ask people to change their lifestyle. It's just a matter of like, should they enjoy my music or not? I wish I would actually choose if people could listen to my music for free. And if there's a streaming service where like, I don't know, like a decentralized streaming service or something where they could just listen to whatever they wanted and there was no payment at all, I would actually do that and take my music off Spotify if enough people used it and then just encourage people to support me elsewhere. Even if I made less money doing it, like I think that would be just better in general. Well, you talk about Apple products, but you know, I'm a I'm an Android user and you know, from Same, yeah. the idea of downloading something, putting it on my phone, transferring it with a cable, like you've already, you've already lost me at the cable part. Um, yeah. But, you know, if I'm committed enough and I love the artist enough, I'm going to do it. Right. And so right. I do that. And then my phone clears off files like over a certain period of time, which I don't even know why it does that. You know, mm. so so me just maybe not being super techie in general, yeah. uh, there's just a barrier to entry. And I haven't heard anyone say you're pun- you potentially are punishing your fans by just not yeah. having it everywhere and accessible because maybe they only use Spotify for all things. And that's maybe only, that's the only way they know how to use it, you know, how to yeah. access music. I, I mean, when I look at the demographics, I have a lot of fans who are like in their seventies, believe it or not, you know, like, and it's like, you can't, like, I'm not going to ask my mom to like download an MP3, you know, she doesn't know how to do that. And it's, and it's fine. Why would she, you know, it's just, it's not in her Spotify so easy. She just types in yeah. the Beatles and it plays and that's all there is, you know, yeah. but that technology Obviously, you know, that ability has is coming from an influx of venture capital dollars that have subsidized our lifestyles to be able to have it. And it's not sustainable. Who knows what's going to happen? So like when I first started becoming really critical of Spotify, I immediately was like, OK, well, I, I've had this idea forever that this and, and by the way, I'm not like a social I'm not like a hardcore socialist or anything, but I've had the idea of socialized copyright since the iTunes lawsuit. Like, I was like, why are these companies even involved in this? Like, we already have the government so involved in the enforcement of copyright, like, you know, that 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 is where it comes from in our current understanding of it. So we already have the government so involved in the enforcement of copyright. Why aren't they involved in, like, the royalty mechanism? This isn't incredibly complicated stuff. Why don't we just, why didn't the government just have a data center that supplies music to people and then they get an internet tax. And then how much would that internet tax cost? And I wish that I had the answer for you that I found, but I did that video like a year and a half ago and it is just gone. But it was less than what you would pay for all of the, the, the average cost that the American pays for the average amount of streaming services, Netflix, Spotify, Hulu, whatever it is that they have, the average cost it would be lower to have access to everything at all times through your tax dollars. And artists would be paid, I think I, with that accounting, I think I lumped in like 
a 30% pay bump for artists, film production companies, whoever it is that's involved in the, in getting the money from the IP. And so, and then for anybody who I set it up with like a bracket system to where, you know, people earning under a certain amount per year, they wouldn't have to pay for anything, you know, because that that's always been, a. I grew up in a really poor area. I, I did not have access to discovery channel when I was a kid. I did not, none of my friends did. And that always hurt me a little bit. That always just felt not when I was a kid, but I mean, growing up, it's like, wait a minute. So like I ran a nonprofit music school in South Chicago and I was like, I would always think like these kids don't have the same access to music education and general education as a kid whose parents can afford, you know, every channel on cable TV or every streaming service or whatever it is. That's sort of my, my argument with why I am, closer to being a copyright abolitionist than I am to 